you this morning, we're to be in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2. It's the one you expected, right? Luke 2. If you come on to church during Christmas, we're going to go to Luke or we're going to go to Matthew. Uh, we're going to be in Luke 2 this morning, but we are also going to reference Isaiah 52 as well. So if you want to, uh, if you have one of these little things in your Bible, uh, you can uh, put your place at Isaiah 52. Uh, but we'll also be in Luke 2 this morning as we continue in our series Christmas music. We've looked at some great hymns. We've looked at different hymns. We, we began the series in a joyous place with joy to the world. Uh, and then we moved last week to a more melancholy, what, what we call a, a kind of a heartfelt or, or kind of one of those ones that, uh, songs that you get you in your feels, so to speak, and that is uh, the uh, O Come, O Come, uh, Emmanuel. This week we look to a song that uh, has great origins, and I love this song because uh, it is simplistic, but its message is clear, and its message is powerful, and that is, go tell it on the mountain. Each week, I've put a little blurb in your bulletin about the, what the song was all about, but this song has particular roots that I think are important uh, for the, the message of the song itself. This song was an African-American or a Negro spiritual it was written uh, during the time probably of the Civil War. We don't really know. There's not an author that is named, uh, but it is, was made popular uh, by a, a man in the late 1800s who uh, traveled around and sang it with a group and uh, made it a very popular song. But this, the, the fact that this was born out of oppression, this was born out of a place of a, a, a blight in American history, uh, that is the, the blight of slavery. It was born of a people who were oppressed, a people who knew suffering, a people who were looked down on. Uh, I could say a lot here. I'll suffice to say that this is a blight that remains even to this day. And we do well to look at this song and know that its message is for us, and it's for a, from a people that were oppressed. Go tell it on the mountain goes like this. While shepherds kept their watching over silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The two other verses that we have in our hymnal are, The shepherds feared and trembled when lo, above the earth, rang out the angel chorus that hailed the Savior's birth. Of course, we have the refrain again, but then the next other verses, Down in a lowly manger the humble Christ was born, and God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. And there's another verse of this song that's not listed in your hymnal. Uh, it's one that I actually think is a travesty that we don't have it in our hymnals uh, because it's probably the most powerful of all of the verses. And it goes like this. He made me a watchman upon the city wall. And if I am a Christian, I am the least of all. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Now this Negro spiritual or African American spiritual came from a place of feeling least or less than. And it makes sense that, that this song would be based out of two really great passages. And that first passage is Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. And we're going to read this passage together as we stand together. We've heard it one time already, but we're going to stand together in the honor of reading God's word. And we're going to read Luke chapter 2. The other passage is Isaiah 52, 7, and you can flip there and we'll read it as we go along. Luke chapter 2, we'll begin in verse 8 with the shepherds. This is God's word. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And let this be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with and the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. The shepherds 
When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is God's holy word. May he add its blessing to our heart this day. You may be seated. Now, I feel I I dressed appropriately for the occasion. Uh, For those of you who love Charlie Brown, it's my favorite Christmas movie. Uh, You guys might say— you're weird, but that's fine. It is my favorite Christmas one. And in, you know, of course, at the end, the famous thing is Linus gets up and he quotes this exact passage. In fact, I, I, I wanted to say, instead of uh, among whom the, uh, he is well pleased, I wanted to say peace on earth among men, because that's what he says in, 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 uh, in Charlie Brown. But uh, this passage is, a, it, it feels like when we come to passages like this and we hear them every single year, that they get lost on us. But see, this passage is really where uh, the, the inspiration came for this song, Go Tell It on the Mountain. We see the, the, them talking about the shepherds. They were out there, and they, they saw a light, and then they, they feared and trembled, and, and all of a sudden the angels came, and, and, and then they went to go and see this, this uh, Christ child that was born in a manger. And so we see that this passage is really the, the kind of the inspiration for this, uh, this song. But there's another song that really uh, is an inspiration for this song, and that's Isaiah 52.7. It's not going to be on the screen because I didn't tell Amy to put it there. Uh, But Isaiah 52.7, I'm going to read it for you. It says this, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. You see, you might have questioned, right? We're, we're reading this, and it talks about going and telling it on the mountain. Now, you might just say, oh, that's just hyperbole, right? There's no mountains in the, the birth story of Jesus. They were out in a field, and they were in a, an inn, and Bethlehem is a very flat place, right? It's a very, there's not a ton of mountains around. So where does this mountain come from? Well, it comes from this passage in Isaiah 52. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet who bring good news. You see, this message, the message of, oh, go, go tell it on the mountain, is a message that is for all people, but is a message of good news. And this good news is going to have three M's this morning. You ready for them? First, we're going to look at the market of the good news. We're going to look then at the message of the good news. And then finally, we're going to look at the mission of the good news. The market of the good news, the message of the good news, and the mission of the good news. First, the market of the good news. Now, anyone who's in here that works in uh, retail or works in, maybe, maybe you work, I don't know, maybe you, you work in some kind of uh, advertising or, or some kind of job like that. But anybody who knows, right, when you get a new product, you have to advertise the product, right? You have to figure out who is this product for, what's the market for this product, and then you make a really terrible ad most of the time where there, you get the worst actors in the world to, to act out the, these impossible, never-before-seen scenarios. Like, you've seen these commercials. You know what I'm talking about, right? Has this ever happened to you? And then they, like, open their cabinet, and then a flood of Tupperware falls out on them. And it's like, and, and, or, or they're trying to put a Tupperware on, and then all of a sudden it just splashes all over the place because they're incompetent, right? You, you've seen what I'm talking about, right? And, and you, as they're building these uh, ads, right? They have a market in mind, right? The market is somebody who maybe has a disorganized Tupperware, or maybe they've tried to put a Tupperware lid on, and it's hard to do, right? There's a market for every product. Now, I I do have to say this morning that that most products you know, you know exactly who they're trying to to market it to right away, right? There's very niche products, right? There's not a huge, uh, uh, you know, there's not many products that are for everyone, but can I just ask a question this morning that has always baffled me? Why do we have ads for toilet paper? Everybody use—if you don't use toilet paper, then then come see me. I'll pray for you, and I will give you toilet paper. Okay, maybe you use a bidet. I don't know, but that's fine. We're we're not in Europe, so I can say that, right? But why do we have ads for toilet paper? Everyone uses toilet paper. 
And see, this is the thing. The, the good news of Jesus, the good news that the shepherds heard, the good news that we're supposed to go and tell on the mountain has a market. And do you want to know what the market for the gospel, the market for the good news is? Well, you know what the disciples thought it was. The disciples who followed Jesus, they thought it was for the brightest and the best. In fact, when, uh, when Jesus was confronted with this guy we call the rich young ruler, he was just a young guy. He, we don't know if he was a ruler. We just know he was rich because he came to Jesus, and he, 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 tell, he, sa- he says, look, what must I do to, to inherit eternal life? And he says, well, look, you've got to keep all the commandments. And this guy is a righteous guy. He says, I've done all of that. I've kept every commandment uh, uh, in the law uh, since I was born. But then Jesus says, guess what? You lack one thing, and that is for you to sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. And what did that rich young ruler do? He turned and walked away. Well, most of the time we stop the story right there. You know what happens right after that? The disciples come to Jesus, and it doesn't tell us this, and this is the Andrew according, the, the Bible according to Andrew version, so just take it as, as a grain of salt. I imagine they're like, Jesus, what are you doing, man? This guy's rich. Do you realize the check he could cut for our ministry? Do you realize how much money he could give to, to, to help you to continue to feed the hungry and, and heal the sick? Do you realize this is, I mean, if this guy can't get in, man, we're doomed. It, they literally say that. If this guy can't make it, we're doomed. And you know what Jesus says to that? It's easier, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You see, the disciples thought it was the brightest and the best. It's just the best among us. But guess what? The good news is not just for the best. And in fact, if we were to receive the good news, we must put aside our pride, and we must become a lot like who this message came to in, the, in this passage. Look at it with me, verse 8 of Luke 2. In the same region... There were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And this is who, in verse 9, an angel of the Lord comes to, and the glory of the Lord shones around them, and they were filled with great fear. And this is the one, in verse 10, that they bring the good news to. All right, so here's our, our audience for the, uh, the market for the gospel, the original market for the gospel. It was shepherds. Now, that means nothing to us in our modern day, right? We, we don't really, I mean, look at this nativity, this beautiful nativity that, that was given to us, uh, and look at the shepherd in this nativity. Uh, can, where's Edie? Edie's not here this morning. Erlene, can I touch the, can I touch this? Okay, I'm gonna pick it up. Edie said, it, l- listen, where's Emily? Edie, I was told that no one's allowed to touch this but Edie Mitchell, so I'm touching it, so if I get in trouble, if I don't show up next week, you know why. But look, look at this, <laughs> look at this shepherd. He's a good-looking man, right? He's a good-looking boy. He, he's clean-shaven. He looks like, uh, you know, he, he's got a little satchel here. Man, those are some nice shoes he's got on. Uh, he's a good-looking guy, right? He's in a nice sash. And this is the image that comes up in our mind when we think of shepherds. We think of clean-cut, clean-shaven, and nice. You know, we, we, we have this, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, a whitewashed idea of what, uh, what these uh, people were. But do you know who shepherds really were? Shepherds were the lowest of the low. They were below the lowest of the low. In fact, if you were to look back to the time of of Jesus, shepherds were not even looked at as people. In fact, if if they witnessed a crime, they were not allowed to testify in court because shepherds were thought of as so low. They were homeless. They lived out in a field. They didn't have homes. You want to know who these were? These were the ones living in Tenton City. The ones we walk by and that we pretend aren't there. You know who I'm talking about? Those are, is, this is who the message of the gospel originally came to. One pastor I, I, I was uh, reading this week observed that uh, this job, you want to know how we know this was a low job? Because they gave it to kids. You, you've heard about shepherd boys. David was a shepherd boy. And, and so what, what he observed is, you didn't want to be the guy at the Christmas party who when was asked, what are your kids doing today? And you would say, yeah, they're a shepherd. They'd be like, what happened? Did they give up on their dreams in middle school? 
I mean, they were, they're homeless, right? This is the lowest of the low. And yet here into, uh, into this field where there's this bunch of homeless, stinking shepherds, the good news comes. It's no wonder. It's no wonder that when this song was written, Go Tell It on the Mountain, that the African Americans identified with the shepherds. Because in that moment in history, they would have felt like the lowest of the low. And in fact, they were treated that way. And here's what I know. The good news, the gospel of Jesus, is for the lowly in heart. See, here's the, the biggest thing this morning. If we are to accept the gospel, if we were to, are to accept this good news, we need to become like the shepherds. We need to become like the African-American slave. We need to realize there's nothing that we can do to earn it. And that's what makes it truly good news. See, one of the biggest problems of our heart is, is a word we call pride. It's the original sin. It's the sin of Adam and Eve when they looked at the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and said, God, we don't want you. We want to be like God. We want to be God. And we struggle today with pride. Some of us, when we feel that we're rich in an area of our life, that's when we feel we don't need God in that area. For some of us, we have a lot of money, so we're rich. Praise God if you're rich. But some of us see that richness and, and money and, and material things as a way to fix all of our problems. And so, so what do we do? We don't rely on God for the things. We look to the money to fix the problem. Some of us are really popular. We're rich in popularity. We're rich in, social, uh, in, in the social world. And so we, we have all these people that are telling us who we are. And they say, man, you're a great person. I love, you're the life of the party. We love having you around. And so what do we do when we're rich in this popularity, rich in the social world? What do we do? We don't want to hear from God and what he has to say to us because we have all these other people that are pumping us up and speaking good things into our life. In fact, I, some of us who are rich in popularity, we say we're going to shy away from what God has to say because it might be less than and feels worse than what others say. Here's the reality this morning. Where we feel strong is where we feel we don't need God. Some of us rely on our rich in health. Some of you are in your 70s and 80s and still able to do what you want to do and go where you want to go. I pray that's me in my 70s and 80s. I do. But here's the reality this morning. Those places that we feel that we're the richest is the places we don't feel we need God. I cannot help but think of Ezra in this. <laughs> Ezra has a lot of pride. <laughs> Ezra thinks he can do everything himself. In fact, uh, Megan and I got to go to a, a Christmas party on Friday night at, uh, at, with her company, and uh, we got a babysitter for the first time for Lucy and Ezra. And Ezra was a big boy. He, he, he said, I'm going to be a big boy tonight. I'm going to put myself to bed. I'm going to take a bath myself. I'm going to put myself to bed. I don't need anyone. You want to know when I got home, his light was still on. He never turned, he keeps his light on. His door was open. He never keeps his door open. In fact, last night he told me that he hates when doors are open when he's sleeping. You want to know why he left his light on and his door open? Because mom and dad weren't there. And as much as he thought, I can do all this, and he did it. He took a bath himself, and, and, and our, our great babysitter, she didn't have to do a whole lot with him. But he was still afraid. He thought he was bigger than, he, bigger than his britches. And see, that's the thing that we feel. That's the thing that we do. And it's not until Jesus tells us that we become like a child. And you know what children are? They're weak. It's not until we become dependent on God that we can receive this good news. You know, the times when we feel rich are the times when we're making our, uh, the comparison of ourselves to the wrong standard. The times when we don't feel like we need God are the times when we're in this comparison trap. We look at other people and we say, well, at least I'm not like them. At least I'm faithful to my spouse. At least I'm not 
cheating on my taxes or whatever. I'm not lying. I'm not a, a, an unfaithful person. At least I'm not like them. You know what? Jesus had something to say about that. In fact, he told a story of a church service much like ours. And he said there were two people that came into this church service. The one was a righteous person. And this righteous person was, was really a good person. In fact, if we were to look at somebody here at New Hope that's like this person, it would be the person that serves on the Connect team, the person that sings, who prays, who teaches. It would be somebody who's faithful here every Sunday. And they said this person came into, uh, into the, the, the church service and they walked right up to the front and they were praying and saying, thank God for how righteous I am. And they said there was another guy who came in. And this guy, he couldn't even come to the front because he was so hated by everybody else there because he was a tax collector. You see, tax collectors, it, 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 when it came to uh, kind of the economic uh, things, in, in, it was shepherds and then tax collectors were just one step above uh, shepherds. And so he walked into the back of the room and you know what he did? He beat his chest, it tells us. And he said, God, forgive me because I'm a sinner. And he stood in the back of the room and he kept saying that over and over again, God, forgive me because I'm a sinner. God, forgive me because I'm a sinner. And you, you know what Jesus said? his commentary on this story. He said, one of those guys walked away justified, that is made right with God. And it's not the one you think. It's the guy who lowered himself, who realized his need for God was able to receive the good news. See, sometimes in our lives, God has to put us flat in our back so we have no other place to look but up. Who are we comparing ourselves to? Are we comparing ourselves to the guy that sits at the back? Or are we comparing ourselves to the standard that Jesus set? You know what Jesus told us? That if we are to inherit the kingdom of God, that this is how we are to be. It says that our first reaction when someone slaps us across the face is to do what? Turn the other cheek. I'm going to guess that 99% of us in here, that if someone slapped, if I came down and slapped you in the face right now, that you would not turn the other cheek at me. You'd probably never come back to this church, number one. <laughs> and you surely would pro I mean, most of you would probably try to punch my lights out. But you know what Jesus said? If, if we're to inherit the kingdom of God, this is the standard. That if someone uh, slaps us across the face, we'd turn the other cheek. You know what else he told us? He told us if we are to, to look at someone who's in need and look at someone who needs something, we are to take the coat, very coat, off of our back and give it to them. You, you know what Jesus said? It's not just good enough to not cheat on your significant other. It's, it, you must not even look at anyone else and lust after them. It's not good enough just not to murder someone. And listen, some of you are going to feel like murdering someone in the next week. I already know it. We're having Christmas gatherings. You're going to be with your family in close, close proximity. You might feel like murdering someone. He said it's not good enough just to not act on that. It, 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 he said what you actually need to do is not even feel that in your heart anyway. You see, we're comparing ourselves to the wrong standard. The standard I'm comparing myself to all the time, I do it all the time, is the pastor down the street. Well, at least I'm not like him. You see, we have to realize our need. We have to become like shepherds, because that's the market for the gospel. The market for the gospel is not the best and the brightest. The market for the gospel is those who are lowly and meek in heart. Are we part of that market this morning? Or have we so filled with pride, said, God, I don't need you in this area of my life. You know, back when I was in seminary, one of the guys who, who was kind of, he came in as a, like a guest lecturer. He was a pastor in the area. I really looked up to him. He was, he had a, a very successful church there in the area, and he said, told the story of, of his life, and he said he was going along and he was building the church and all of a sudden one night he woke up and he had a, 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 an aneurysm and he ha had a stroke that caused him to just pass out. He thought he was going to die. God kept him from that and he said, you know, I realized in that moment that pastoring or even the Christian life, it, it, there, there's something here where we feel like we can do it all, but, but being a pastor or being a Christian, really the way we need to be a Christian is up here. 
And he said, our effort and what we can do really comes to about right here. So what we should be, the standard that we should be at, who we should be as a pastor, who I should be as a person, who I should be as a husband, as a, as a wife, as a child, as, as a, uh, an employee, all those things, the standard that God sets for us is here. But really, even through our best effort, we can only come to here. And so he, he says, look, there's this gap here. Where, where does this gap come from? How, how do we get to a place where, where we can actually meet that standard? Well, the gap is God. God fills in that gap. When we come to the end of ourself, there's nowhere else that we can look but up to God. I was talking with Jim this morning, with Jim Heinrich, and we've talked for about an hour, and, and he, he said, Andrew, I just feel hope, helpless. I just feel like there's nothing I can do. I've done all I can. I put her in the place to succeed. There's just nothing I can do. And I said, it's funny that you would say that. Because the very thing that I'm about to preach talks to that. When we get to the end of ourselves, we have nowhere else to look but to God. Some of us this morning have come to the end of ourselves. And we're trying to look at all the places. We're, we're trying to look to other people. We're trying to look to our own strength. But the only place that we can look is God. The only way that I can be the pastor that I need to be is to look to God. The only way that you can be the husband or the, the spouse or the significant other you need to be is to look to God. The only way that you can be the child or, or the employee or the, the person that you need to be is to look to God. You see, the market for the gospel, the market for the good news is for the lowly in heart. Now, what about this message? What's the message of the gospel? Look at verse 10. Here's the message. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. See, here's the message of the, of the good news. It's the same message that he tells us that we need to go and tell on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, that Jesus is is born. See, the message of the gospel is that Jesus has come. Jesus has come for, for many things. He's come to, for forgiveness of sins, but the thing that I think really comes out in this, this African-American spiritual is, is uh, the focus of a lot of Negro spirituals was the promise of relief from suffering. You see, they were going through a lot of suffering. And so they looked to Jesus as the one who, yes, came and forgave them, came and, 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 and made them whole, but, it, but the one who was going to relieve, ultimately, their suffering. You see, I think we very, very rarely talk about this aspect of the good news. See, Jesus did come to die. He did come to set things right and make us right with God, but there's another thing he came to do. He came to redeem or buy back or make new all of creation. Romans, in Romans chapter 8, Paul puts it this way, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. See, the message of the good news is that Jesus came to free sinners, but he also came to make all things right. There will come a day when there will be no more suffering, no more pain, There'll come a day when there will be no, no more racism, no more classism. There'll be no more subjecting people to, to our, our whims. There'll be no more not caring for the poor. There will be no more sin. And we long for that day. And you know, who, the scriptures tell us that we're not the only ones who long for that day. The creation itself, our world itself, longs for that day. And Jesus, when he came 2,000 years ago, came to inaugurate that. And we, I think, here on earth, need to look at where 
the creation has been subjected to futility or where we ourselves have been subjected to the curse, the futility of, uh, of sin, and, 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 and realize that Jesus can speak into those areas of our life. And Jesus can give us freedom and get, begin to give us freedom. See, some of us in here, where we feel the curse the most is in our heads. We're wired a bit different. We're predisposed to be depressed. We're predisposed to be anxious. We're predisposed to, to be OCD about things, to be ADD, to be ADHD. And, and the thing is, God came, Jesus came, to speak into those things and to start us on a, a, a path towards healing. Where are you affected by the curse? Where have you been subjected to futility? Jesus came to make those things right. I know I keep bringing Jim up, but what Jim's going through is such a, a picture of this. He told me he felt helpless, but he also told me another thing that gave me such hope. He said, you know, I, I know that I know Jesus, and I know God, and I'm walking with him, and I'm praying, and every quiet time, I'm just asking and praying, and, 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 and just asking him to, to give me strength. He said, you know, the thing that I don't understand, though, is how someone that goes through something like this, who does not have the good news, does not know the message of the good news, that Joe, even though she is probably going to die from this cancer, We'll be reunited one day with him. How do we live without that good news, without that reality? He said, I don't understand it. It's like, it's the only thing that's keeping me going. It's the only thing that keeps me sane. See, God, one day will make all things right, but living in this suffering world, in this futile world, we can only look forward to hope, with hope for the day that he will come again. We've seen here in this psalm, in this, pa in this song, in this passage, we've seen the market for the gospel. We've seen the message of the gospel. Now the mission. Look there at verse 17 with me. They come, they see the baby, in verse 17, when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in their heart. Verse 20, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. See, the market of the gospel is those who are lowly in heart. The message of the gospel is that Jesus has come to set things right. The mission of the gospel is to take it to God the streets. Take it everywhere. You see, these shepherds didn't just ponder and pull these things into their heart as Mary did. What did they do? They went out and broadly told what was happening. Broadly told to anyone who would listen, here's what I just saw. Jesus Christ is born. Go tell it everywhere. Go tell it on the mountains, over the hills, everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. We have to take this message, this message to everyone, everywhere. See, we look at this, this uh, song and we, we see the go tell it on the mountain. And, and you see, mountains are important when it comes to the Old Testament. In fact, most cities were built on mountains, and so those who would be a watchman on the city, city gate would, would be able to see when good news was coming. A lot of the ways that they sent messages back in those days, they didn't have cell phones. They didn't call and say, hey, yeah, we won the war, or hey, uh, you know, send a telegram. No, they would come, and they would wave flags, and they would ba bear a banner, and the banner meant something. It either meant, hey, we, we won, or hey, we're losing. And so th th as these watchmen would be watching out over and, and looking out and see a banner coming, they would see the good news. Hey, we've won the war. We've done this thing. There's good news coming. And they would run and tell the whole city, look, this, this messenger is coming, and they've come to make uh, things right. They've come to give us good news. You know, the last uh, uh, stanza or last verse of uh, Go Tell Them on the Mountain goes like this. He made me a watchman upon the city wall. 
And if I am a Christian, I am the least of all. See, everywhere we go, and every person we come into contact with needs the good news of Jesus. And the message of this song is that, yes, we have, we have a market for the message. We have a message of the good news. But we have to go and tell it. Can I, can I tell you something that's very, I mean, it's almost like, duh. Good news only becomes good news to someone when you tell it to them. Let me say that again. It's really simple. Good news only becomes good news to someone when you tell it to them. If we keep it bottled up, it's not good news. It's not good news to them because they've never heard it. In fact, Romans tells us this very thing. Paul Paul tells us this very thing. It it actually quotes Isaiah 52, if you believe it. How then will they call on him who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching or telling them? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Are we preaching the good news? Are we teaching it and taking it to the highways and byways? Are we going over the mountain and everywhere we go, are we taking the good news of Jesus with us? Romans 10 tells us that they can't, people can't believe unless they've heard. And they can't hear unless someone teaches. And listen, we can't teach unless we're sent. And can I tell you this morning, if, if you get nothing else out of this morning, if nothing else has, has hit you between the eyes, this is what you need to take with you. I'm sending you right now, if you have received the good news of Jesus into your heart, I'm sending you right now, this week, with everyone that you come in contact with, you should be sharing that good news too. How can they hear unless someone preaches? How can they know? How can they preach unless they're sent? You know, I, I heard several years ago a story of a, a young man. He was a, a pastor. He became a great pastor. Um, I'm not going to tell his name, but um, he tells the story of how the night that he gave his life to Jesus, the guy preached this awesome message. And he remembers coming down the aisle, and he remembers kneeling at the altar, and he remembers looking up and seeing this man's shoes. These were some nice shoes that he had on. They were two-tone, black and white, beautiful shoes. And he remembers thinking in that moment, man, those are some beautiful shoes, those are some beautiful feet. And he looked at, at the feet of this man and he said, man, this is bringing the gospel, the, the good news, to life. Because the Bible does say how beautiful are the feet to those who preach the good news. Look, some of you don't like the way your feet look. You know how I know? You have 80,000 loofahs and scrubs that you scrub your feet with to try to make them look good. You go to, the, you, you go to get the pedicure so that you can look good when you have those open-toed, uh, open-toed sandals. You want some nice looking feet? Share the good news. Share the good news. You want some good looking toes for the summer? Share the good news. How beautiful are the feet of those who take the good news. I'm not saying your feet are just going to be magical. Magically, they're just going to be what you want them to be. But what I am saying to the person that looks at your feet, Because you've shared that with them. They say they're the most beautiful feet I've ever seen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the market of the good news. I thank you for the message of the good news. And I thank you now that you have sent us on mission. Help us to, along with the hymn writer of old, to sing this song and to go and tell it on the mountain and tell it to every person that we come in contact with. Father, I thank you that you loved us enough to send your son to die on a cross for us, but you sent him not just to die so that we can have forgiveness of sins, but God, so that one day all things, all things would be made right. 
All injustices, all wrongs will be righted, God, and we pray and long for that day. But until that day, help us to take the good news to the highways and byways, over the hills and everywhere. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for giving us beautiful feet. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.